Hello and welcome to the Birds in Winter series. My name is Jen Balava and I'm the lead naturalist for the Burlington County Park System. This multi-part series will detail all different aspects of birds and bird behavior relating to the species we have in our area of New Jersey in the wintertime. Part one is all about the adaptations that birds have to survive the winter months. When it's cold outside, we simply put more clothes on, go inside and turn up the heat. But birds must live outside in all kinds of weather. Their first line of protection is their feathers. Fluffing their feathers creates layers of air, which are trapped in between the feathers for better insulation. By tucking in their head, bill, and legs into that thicker coat helps them reduce heat loss. Let's look at some photo examples. So here's a regular junco, and here's a fluffed up junco. Here is a normal chicken, and here is a miserably cold chicken. And finally, here is a red-shouldered hawk, normal. And this is a red-shouldered hawk taken on a very cold day at Amico Island. So you can see how different they look in appearance. And this is all to reduce heat loss. In addition, some small birds, like golden crown kinglets, are capable of entering something known as torpor, which is like a temporary lesser degree of hibernation, just for the night. Basically, the reduction of body temperature and heart rate through torpor helps conserve precious energy as the bird loses a lot of reserves of fat each night, and this helps it survive to the next day. And on extremely cold days, birds reduce their activity and stay in sheltered areas, such as in tree cavities, under evergreens, or even under the eaves of buildings. You can see in this picture that there are many, many different types of feathers that have different functions on a bird. We're probably most familiar with tail and wing feathers shown on the left, but the feathers that are really important for insulating birds from cold are the down feathers, which you see here. This graphic shows a close-up of a down feather. A down feather is made up of these free-floating strands called barbs. The arrangement of the barbs traps large quantities of air, which makes for excellent insulation. Of course, many seabirds that are found in very cold, windy places have very protective down for insulation against the conditions. And of course, their young are covered in that fluffy down. Down feathers are also very important for young chicks to survive until they get their, their new feathers. Obviously, birds like ducks and geese that are active right away, or birds that sit for long periods of time without their parent to keep them warm, like owls, chicks, these need a lot of down to keep them warm as well. And of course, down is also used as nest material, as you can see in this picture where the duck used her own down to insulate and protect the eggs. So this just shows that down is very effective in protecting birds in many different parts of their lives, but especially in the winter. Songbirds in colder climates have more feathers in the winter, adding about 600 small down feathers on the body. Water birds also have a lot more feathers, particularly on the parts that are in contact with the water. Feathers are water resistant because of the spacing of the barbs. Water can neither flow nor stick to the surface. Water birds have feather barbs closer together, making it harder for water to penetrate. In the picture on the left, you can see that exact thing happening 
where the water is simply beating up on the surface of their feathers. On a duck, feathers wrap around the underside to create a waterproof shell. Cormorant feathers have a different adaptation. The barbs at the margins of the feathers are free, so they get wet as water sticks the barbs together. But the center of the feathers holds the barbs in place to repel the water. This keeps water from reaching the bird's skin. When the added weight of water in the feathers reaches about 6% of their body weight, cormorants have to get out of the water and dry their wings. The advantage of this is basically reducing their buoyancy, which allows the birds to dive deeper and with a lot less effort. In fact, cormorants are the most efficient marine predators in the world. Feathers wear out and have to be replaced in a process called molting. Species that change color for winter actually molt twice a year, once to acquire a drabber non-breeding plumage and then again later for the bright plumage they need for the spring summer breeding season. Molting in the winter means they have a drab plumage so they can blend in and be more camouflaged. Here you can see a goldfinch in the middle of the summer. It's bright golden yellow, but in the winter time, goldfinches turn a very dull drab brownish olive color. And this is a result of the molt that occurs in the fall. And so they have this very drab coloration in the winter so that they can blend in, be hidden from predators. Another example is the yellow rumped warbler. This picture shows uh, a yellow rump in very nice breeding plumage in the summer, but in the winter, yellow rumps have a much drabber plumage. So clearly, feathers are a very important winter adaptation. Next, let's talk a little bit about adaptations for finding food in the winter. With a high metabolism and high body temperature, Birds need a lot of energy, which means a lot of food. There are two kinds of ways they can store energy. Fattening up during the day and then burning off those reserves at night. And they can also cache food for later. Most of the day is devoted to finding and catching food. Birds lose about 10% of their body weight overnight every single night. A single robin can eat about 14 feet of earthworms in a day. If you look at the graph on the top left, it simply shows that in the colder months of the year, the goldfinch has to forage and put on a lot more fat and doesn't need to do as much in the warmer months. Some birds invest a lot of effort into storing food for later use. In the picture on the right, you can see acorn woodpeckers, which are not found around here. Those are our Western species, but are a perfect example of birds that cache food. You can see all the acorns where they're basically storing them in holes in the, in the, in the bark of the trees. In our area, Blue jays store and hide food for winter and are really careful to keep their hiding places secret. They usually hide food on the ground by digging a small hole and stuffing the food into it and then covering it up with a leaf or other small debris. Using their incredible navigational abilities and extraordinary memory, they can keep track of thousands of different hidden items. Some blue jays spy on others and steal food after it has been cached. If a jay thinks it was observed while hiding food, it will actually return secretly a few minutes later to move the food to a new and better hiding place.
Chickadees, titmice, and nuthatches also store food items and remember where they stored them for later use. A single chickadee can store up to 80,000 food items in a season and can remember not only where each item is, but also details about the quality of the food. The golden crown kinglet is a really tiny songbird. It's actually one of the smallest birds in North America, just a little bit bigger than a hummingbird. They weigh about as much as a nickel. They migrate from the northern evergreen woods in Canada and New England, and they are mainly found in coniferous woods here in New Jersey in the wintertime. But unlike the chickadee and titmice and nuthatches that eat a combination of insects and seeds, the golden crown kinglet eats only insects and spider protein, no seeds at all. So how can it manage to survive the winter? Well, about 85% of daylight hours is devoted to finding food. If you watch a golden crown kinglet, they're constantly flitting about at night, they find a sheltered spot and huddle up with about 10 or more kinglets and enter into torpor to preserve energy. Kinglets in the winter need at least 8 calories a day, which doesn't sound like much to us. But if we eat at the same rate, a 100-pound person would need about 67,000 calories, which is about 26 pounds of peanuts or 27 large pizzas every day. If that isn't amazing enough, golden crown kinglets also will actually use the resident birds that have local knowledge of the forest and where food sources are in order to help them find food. So if you're looking for golden crown kinglets in the winter, you'll often find them in a mixed flock with chickadees and tent mice. So birds feeding in flocks with different species of birds like chickadees and titmice and kinglets is something that we often observe quite a lot of in the winter time. We also see it with different species of blackbirds feeding together. It's basically so it's much easier to find food, a limited food source, if you have a lot more help to look for it. They're not competing for nesting resources so they can help each other look for food. Another strategy that some birds have is to just simply shift their diet from eating insects or invertebrates to another food source. In the case of thrushes like robins and bluebirds, they go from eating insects and worms to berries. If it's a mild winter and there's plenty of wild berries, these birds could be resonant from Connecticut and New York all the way to Georgia. Birds like the great blue heron shift from eating fish and frogs and snakes to small birds and rodents in the winter if the water is frozen. This varied diet allows it to live further north than any other heron. But two-thirds of the birds that were here in New Jersey in the spring and summer must migrate to find food further south. Migration is clearly a key adaptation for winter survival, which is our topic for part two. So I hope you'll join me then. Thanks for watching.